Amen. If you can say that this morning, you can say it all. If it's uh, well with your soul, you don't need anything else. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. You, I was sweating it just for a minute this morning, but the Lord knew all about that. Matthew 17, and I'll begin reading in the very first verse. Matthew 17, in the first verse, the Bible says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up an, an, into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Behold, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us, make, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Rise, be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. I'd like to preach this morning, the Lord being my helper, on the thought, it depends on how you see Him. Dear Lord, we thank You, we praise You, and give You great glory and honor for simply being on the throne this morning and, and doing all things well. We praise You for that. Lord God, this evening, Lord, we pray that You would be with us as a people. Lord God, that You would send the Holy Ghost this way and that You would minister unto Your people that are here, Lord, with Your Word and with Your Spirit. Lord, we pray for the lost, Lord, that You might speak to them this morning. Lord, that You'd give them life and that You'd speak to them life everlasting and we'd be faithful to give You praise for it. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, you don't hear it preached on as much, I think, as I'd like to because uh, I don't know a lot of people understand it, uh, exactly what the purpose was. Um, in the first verse, the Bible says that after six days and uh, the previous six days, uh, He had showed them, uh, he had, that's when... Peter realized, and Peter said, Thou art the Christ. And so six days after this, you know, and, and just because Peter seen it and got it and understood it, didn't mean that everybody will. See, seeing, seeing Jesus as the Christ is a gift. It's not something that you get on your own. So at six days after they seen uh, that Jesus, I mean, excuse me, that Peter saw in faith, that Jesus was the Christ, this is, this is when this happened. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. Now, I want you to notice two things. I don't know that James and John knew that he was Christ yet or not. We know that Peter did. I think they did. John was a very believing man, and John uh, was a very trusting man in Christ. And I want you to see also that he separated his special three from the other nine and just showed them. Now, uh, you know, this is the thing we realize. The, the, any way that you see Christ, any way that he's manifested to you is a great gift. It's a wonderful thing. And the most wonderful thing is to see Him as Savior. That, that, that's a manifestation that belongs only to the elect. And, and so we find then that He pulls them apart out of, the, out of the normal routine. And then it says, a high mountain. You know, uh, uh, it takes work to see Jesus for who He is. 
Now, I've climbed one mountain in my life, and Matthew and Andrew had to help me part of the way. And you know what? I found it's work. And the higher you go, the more short of breath you get because the air is thin up there. And, and, and it, is a, it is a difficult task. Now, one thing with grace that I think is misconstrued today, well, you don't have to do nothing. It's all of grace. Well, if you desire to see Jesus differently this morning, it's going to take some work. <coughs> it's going to take some prayer. It's going to take some study. It's going to take some paying attention to the preaching and paying attention to the Holy Ghost if you want to see Jesus in a different way. So it was some effort on their part. Uh, verse 2, And was transfigured before them. Now, we don't know of any, but I want you to see that nobody else saw it, nobody else was called, and nobody else climbed the mountain except these three individuals, and he was transfigured. Now, some people say, well, this was, uh, this was Jehovah God being manifested. No, it wasn't. He was transfigured. He looked different. You know, Jesus looked different a lot of times in his ministry. He, he looked different to the point sometimes they didn't even recognize him. And, and, and that was okay. And, and so even in that, he manifested himself differently. Now, he was manifesting himself as the Son of God, but it wasn't God Jehovah because God Jehovah said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The two, two of the God entities were there, but... He wasn't presenting himself as God. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment as white as light. Now this is just the exact same way in Revelation chapter 1, where you'll see Christ walking in and among the candlesticks. He manifests himself the exact same way. You know what? Wouldn't it be a glorious thing this morning to behold Jesus walking in and among the candlesticks? Yeah. To see him manifested just in that way. And you say, well that's an impossibility. Well, uh, I see what you're saying because he's at the right hand of the Father doing his intercession. But at the same time, I think we could see a lot more than we do if we look at it spiritually. Yeah. If, we, if, we, if, we, huh, if we put some effort into it. And so he... he, he uh, looks like he does in the book of Revelation. Verse 3, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, or Elisha, talking with him. Now, I want you to notice two things. Uh, the first thing is this. I think these two individuals were selected, and I do believe they were selected by Christ to speak with, uh, because they were Jews among Jews. Moses was the greatest leader that ever lived. And then we find Elisha, he was that prophet that told the truth even when it took hide, hair, and off. So two different individuals, two different ministries, and it was ministries that an average Jew loved and respected more than, any, than anybody else. And so he knew that these would get his attention. Besides that fact, I don't know if there's any great, uh, any, any great significance of who he pulled out because he could have pulled out anybody. You see what I'm saying? It didn't have to be these two. If he wanted uh, Elisha uh, and, uh, and Malachi, it could have been Elisha and Malachi. You see what I'm saying? It, it could have been anybody, but he knew those two individuals would get a Jew's attention. And, and that's exactly, probably why he did that. Now, I also want you to see that um, he says, notice what Peter says, and then answered Peter and said unto Jesus. Now, just for, just because I like to point it out in the modern day, 
Verse 1 says Jesus. Verse two, uh, 4 says Jesus. You know what the Son of God's earthly name was? It was Jesus. Amen. And thou shalt call him Jesus. And because, see, if he had gone by Jewish tradition, uh, Jesus' son would have been Joseph. The oldest son always born. And you know, we still do that, either consciously or subconsciously in the modern culture. I'm, at, I'm Larry Wayne. Uh, Adam is Adam Wayne. His oldest son is Adam Wayne Jr. Even if we don't think about it, we do it anyway. You see what I'm saying? It's almost like it's an inbuilt thing. And, and, and so I want you to see that the very fact that they named him Jesus is significant because it didn't follow tradition. So we need to, we need to recognize and acknowledge that. So, uh, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses and one for Elias. Now, uh, I want you to see that Peter did not get it. And also, I want to just interject that a tabernacle was not a temple. A tabernacle was a tent. And so he wasn't saying, let's build three, three uh, temples here. He says, let's, let's build some tents. <laughs> kind of wanting to have a tent meeting. And he just didn't get it. You know why? He was too impressed with Elisha and Moses. See, sometimes we get impressed about personalities, don't we? Uh, you, you know why uh, Billy Graham was so popular? They were impressed by his uh, personality. Jack Van Indy. Yeah. Which I never understood this because I, I think I, the first time I saw him, I thought he was a nut. Uh, but there's a lot of people impressed by him. It's his personality. And these two individuals, they 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 were uh, they they were overcome not with Christ, but who he was, but who he was speaking with. You know who you need to be overcome by this morning. You need to be overcome by Christ. Because he did something that Moses couldn't do, and he did something that Elijah couldn't do, and he did something that no one else could possibly do for you, and that was to pay to pay your sin debt. Verse 5. And while he, meaning Peter, and while he spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice uh, out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. Now this is the only, not the only time that God Jehovah manifested Himself in Jesus' ministry. Because if you'll remember when He was baptized by John, He says the very same thing. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You know, you know what baptism really is? It's pleasing to God. Yeah. I don't know anything else that it really does or is. It tells the story of Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. But you know what? There's no magical power in baptism. Show some obedience, maybe. But it is pleasing. You know what? If something's pleasing to God, Jehovah, we should be on it. And, and so we find then that uh, that the Lord God has to point out the real reason. And what He was saying was this: Listen, see Jesus. You look at Jesus. It doesn't have anything to do with Elisha. It doesn't have anything to do with Moses. You see Jesus. And you know what? That's what we need this morning. We need to see Jesus in some manner, in some way this morning. Really, in every service that the Lord gives New Testament church to have, to have here, some little way, we need to see Jesus. We need to see who He is. We need to see uh, exactly what His ministry was about. And so the Lord God of Je the Lord God Jehovah had to kind of point out the reason for the transfiguration. Verse seven. 
And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. Uh, you, you know what? Uh, th th this is what I get out of this. When you get out of the will of God, look out. Because they missed the boat, and then when God spoke, they were flat on their face. And don't you think it's interesting that that's how really we're to pray? Huh. Isn't it interesting when He knocks us on our, off our feet? And, and that's exactly what He did. So He was, he, he was flat on the face there. Uh, they were flat on the face in the Lord. Now, what would they, when He said, uh, be not afraid, there had to be some reason He thought they would be afraid. You, so that tells me this, when we see Christ, when we see Jesus, be afraid that you don't make a mistake. In other words, there's ways to see Jesus that are just not scriptural. They're just not like the Bible teaches. There's some ways to see Jesus that are wrong. You know what? I never know. I never knew one thing that Jesus tried to do that wasn't accomplished. Did you? Yeah. So don't see Jesus ever as someone trying to do something. You know what? That's an insult to His nature. It really is. Don't you ever see Jesus with hair down to His shoulders. Now you're going to see that in just about every picture that you ever see of Christ, supposed picture you ever see of Christ. You know what? It's wrong. Don't see Jesus that way. Right? Yes. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we, we, we need to know, we need to intuitively know, how do you see Christ? How do you look at Him this morning? How do you view Him? What, what is your ideas about Christ? Verse 8, And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Now, I'm going to interject this and we're going to move on. That is where Jesus only oneness Pentecostals get their doctrine. However, you know what Jesus said just a few more chapters over? Very soon you, you will see me no more. But behold, I send you a comforter. You see, so that kind of blows that out of the water, doesn't it? But in this specific instance, you know what they were to focus on? You look at me. You view me. Don't you worry about what Judas is Judas is fixing to betray us. Look at me. I'm fixing to be crucified. Look at me. And so whatever situation we see, uh, surely... The way we view Christ is going to impact how we do, how we deal with that situation. Now, now go with me to the Gospel of Luke, just a little further over, Luke chapter two. And in the modern day, very frequently, this is how people view Jesus. Luke chapter two, in verse seven. Luke chapter two. In verse 7, the Bible says, And she, meaning Mary the mother, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, you know, many, many people today don't see Jesus past this. Is there anything... Wrong with seeing Jesus in a manger? Not necessarily. I don't think it should be an idol. I do not believe in nativity scenes because it's worshiping something. I think it's worshiping something. That's my opinion. But I, I, I will say this. There's no problem with remembering that because you know what? The, the real emphasis is not the animals. and You know, I don't know wherever they get the camels and all the stuff they put in there today. 
But you know, this is the thing. That was the sinless Son of God. And the fact is not that He was born in a stable. The fact is not that He, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. All that is fine. The fact is that the living God of heaven had come down to earth. That is the reason that that is the importance. So, have you ever seen that? Have you seen it past the nativity, as they call it? Have you seen it past just a baby in a manger. Yeah. Have, have you, and when you think about that, you know, the incarnation of God into Christ is an amazing thing. And it, it's nothing wrong with looking at it, but certainly we should look past it. Verse 8, and, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring thee good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you that you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with him, with the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory be to God in the highest, on earth, peace, goodwill toward man. So I want you to see there, there's nothing wrong with singing, with you know, thinking about that. If that was not record, if that was recorded in scripture for a reason, that makes sense. But I believe there's not one word there that doesn't have a purpose, don't you? And so this counting of the birth of Christ is appointed it is very important. In fact, if you never see the sinless birth of Christ, probably you're still lost. Because listen, if he was attached to mankind as every one of us is, then he would have been just as sinful as me and you. But he wasn't. He wasn't. And, and so, one way to see Christ then is to think about and meditate upon the sinless birth of Christ, the, the virgin birth of Christ. And that's, that's definitely uh, something to think about. The Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 14. One of my favorite scriptures, Matthew 14 and verse 22. Matthew 14 and verse 22. The Bible says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. Now, uh, let me say this if Jesus constrains you to do something, and um, in the modern day, there's two ways that He constrains people. Number one is His inerrant Word, and number two is the Holy Ghost, and they will never be contrary one to the other. But see, sometimes, you know what? Uh, never where in that King James Bible does it say, Larry Lafferty, you are to preach the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just not there. But the Holy Ghost told me, it constrained me, it required me to do that. And see, it's going to require you to do some things too. Uh, you know, Baptist people don't like the idea of being required to do nothing. And you know what? We are, and when He requires something, there's always a blessing attached. You know what? And, and I love this scripture because He says, He constrained them to get into the ship. And, and he says, I'll meet you on the other side. And no one asks how. But boy, we do, don't we? We do. You know, at least for the moment, they had a lot more faith most of the time than I do because they were just obedient. You know, the best measure of your faith is this, is how obedient are you? Because see, if you're obedient and you're trusting Christ, then you're saying, I think you can take care of all this other stuff. 
I'm going to believe you. That's what faith really is, really is about. And so he says, in straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went on a mountain, he went up into a mountain park to pray. And when the evening came, he was there alone. Now, I want you to see that Jesus didn't get any hurry. He didn't run. Uh, see, the thing of it is, Jesus could be where He wanted to be when He wanted to be. Remember when He left the temple? Nobody even seen Him. Remember when He said, was it to Philip? He said, I knew you were sitting under the tree this morning. See, he, He's not constrained by the flesh. And so He wasn't worried that He wasn't going to be over there in time. He was going to have some time with his father. Went up on the went up on the mountain again. You think deeply about the mountain because listen, uh, we're still climbing them every day if we want to be close unto the Lord. And so he went up to the mountain to pray. Verse twenty four. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came unto them, walking on the sea. You know what? Probably one of my favorite scriptures is right there thinking about how the Lord Jesus Christ defied all ideas that man could have, defied gravity, defied water, defied the storm, and came just walking like I do across the floor to those people in distress. You know what? If they hadn't listened to Him, they never would have seen it. They never would have seen it. You know, you know what? Uh, this is where you see Christ, flesh, and God all wrapped into one. Nothing holds its dominion over Christ. You know, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. That, 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 that's an amazing thing. Nothing, nothing, He's not confounded to what, to what we are trapped to. And that's why when He was crucified, the Bible says this, it didn't say that He died, it said that He gave up the ghost. You know why? Because He was never going to die unless He did. Because that Spirit was His. Yeah. And he was in control. You know what? I don't know what you're going through this morning, but I do know this. Christ is in control. Yeah. And not one thing has happened, not one bill is due, that he doesn't know about. If we believe he's all-knowing, and I certainly do, we have to believe that. One time, uh, years ago, when we was at Bumpus Mills, there was a a lady and her husband trying to buy a house, and the first bill fell through. And the second house, which to me was a much nicer house anyway, it went through without any quirks at all. And, and, and there was a brother there, he said, uh, he says, I don't think God really gets involved with that. And I didn't, I should, I probably would have today. I would say, well, you need to get in the Bible. Because see, if he brought Elijah a meal every day, you know where that meal came from? It came from God. See, he's involved in the closest parts of our lives. And so that's why they were safe on the sea. That's why Christ manifested Himself as God so that when you're in the storm, and brother, you're going to be in them, when you're in the storm, remember Christ is in control. When you're in the midst of the sea, listen, don't be troubled because God's getting the job done. He's doing exactly what He's been given to do. And we should praise Him for it. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verse 27. Matthew 27, and verse 27, the Bible says, And the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered in him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and a reed in his right hands, 
They bowed the knee before Him and mocked Him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon Him and took the reed and smote Him on the head. Now drop down with me, if you will, to verse 35. And they crucified Him and parted His garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched Him. Now, there's a couple of things about this, these Scriptures, and again, they have to be to our benefit because they're there. Is imagine imagining someone beat that merciless? No one caring, and no one saying, "Please don't do that." Now, I have seen a lot of trauma victims in my life, but I've seen nothing compared to this. Uh, you know what? Uh, you need to consider that because that's what paid for your sin. Yeah. You know, you, you stick a little, and, and it's fixing to start up here in a couple months. All through the season when we burn wood, I get splinters every time, all, all, day, all day long, every day. Donna has to dig them out. I've, I've never been like that, but now I get them every time I go. And you know, one little, one little splinter in the right place really hurts. And it keeps you from doing well because if you want to pick something up, pick up one of the babies or something, it drives it a little, it hurts. And, and it, uh, it hurts also to have it removed. But could you imagine thorns crammed into your head? That's exactly what happened. Now, there used to be uh, several thorn trees there on the place. There may still be some, but some of them had thorns. Well, I know where Odessa and Matthew were going to build the house down there. There's a big one down there. Some of them thorns are that long. And could you imagine that job in your head? See, you don't lose nothing in the translation there. It happened just like it stated it happened. And, and you know what? Uh, we need to consider that. We need to look at that because He did that to pay our sin debt. Uh, uh, also, the beating with the cat of nine tails, which happens just before what I read you, and, and Pontius Pilate beat Him unmercifully, and most people died from that. And, and, and then on top of that, you have the crucifixion, which was a respiratory death. I don't think Jesus died that way. I think He bled to death. Because we needed all that precious blood. You see what I'm saying? But the average individual died from suffocation. Now, you know, you never think about suffocation until you get short of breath, do you? Now, Monday, you know why I finally went to the doctor? Because I was short of breath. I started, I started to wear, you know, I go all over that nursing home every day. That's a very big building. I, I run up and down the halls. And I found myself having to stop and rest. Not, not a real pleasant feeling. You see what I'm saying? So if he was short of breath, he experienced that for you and I. He, he experienced that position for you and I. And, and, and until finally it says, and he gave up the ghost. And, and, and we find that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus run in and they beg for the body. They do a quick quick burial so it'd be according to Jewish custom and they're and they're done. Now let me say this I, I like to review the atonement of Christ but he is not on the cross. You know what? You go into a Catholic church right back here where we have our mission field. They have, they have a picture uh, or a mannequin of a person on the cross with his long hair and over there dead. You know what? Christ ain't dead no more. He rose the third day and he's a living individual even now. Yeah. And we ought to give him praise for that. Right. See, we... Uh, uh, we need to think about the atonement. And the only way, you know, ever since I became sovereign grace and, and understood the particular redemption, I won't say a limited atonement because uh, if He wanted to save everybody, He would have. But it's particular to those that He's elect. 
And when I, when I think about that, I have, I, I have to think about the sacrifice. See, you need to spend some time this week thinking about what He did for you. Because listen, it, you don't, you, it, it, it was just as painful as if you and I had had the same experience. It hurt just as much physically and more so emotionally when God the Father turned His back. Gospel of John, chapter 21. John 21 and uh, verse 5. Then, say, then saith unto them, Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? Now, you know, you know what you need to think about this evening, this morning, do you have any meat? Because you know what? I'll say this, the bulk majority of Christians today do not have any meat. Remember what uh, Paul said to the church at Corinth? At the time when you ought to be on meat, you're still on milk. You, you know what? Uh, uh, you know what? You know what some milk is. Very simple milk. It's a very simple food, and, and it's like this. Jesus saves, and you know what He does. Praise be to God. Jesus saves. But you know what's a little meaty, and a lot of people get choked on. Come out from among them and be separate. People choke on that, don't they? You know uh, what people. Some people choke on that the redemption wasn't for everybody. That that atonement was particular. People choke on that, but you know what? It don't make it a bit less true, does it? See, so you know what their resounding answer should have been? Now, I don't think any of them answered. And I said we didn't catch nothing, but they were mentioned, missing the picture. No. We don't have no meat. Because you know what? At this point, they didn't. In fact, you know, one reason they didn't have no meat is because they didn't have the Holy Ghost. Because after the Holy Ghost came down, you see, you, you, you see Peter preaching a message and take hide hair and all. You see what I'm saying? They did not have meat. So I ask you, do you see Jesus as the meat giver? Do you, do you see Jesus as the one providing that those nurturing items that will do when nothing else will do, that will help you when nothing else can help? That's what, that's what we need. Verse, uh, verse 6. And He said unto them, Cast your net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. Now, if you remember it, this was the very first experience that John had, with, that um, that Peter had with Christ. You remember? He launched out a little bit, so uh, he could preach a sermon, and then he said, "You come on, I'm gonna get you some fish." And they cast it and took it. It was so much they couldn't the boat starts. You know what that says to me? He didn't get it. And he still didn't get it. And you know what? I know people who live their entirety of their lives and just don't get it. You, you know who provides for me? Jesus. You know who encourages me? The Holy Ghost. See, everything, everything is in, uh, in His, under His authority, under His dominion, under His provision. And nine times out of ten, we just don't get it. Right. Yeah. And, and so we find then that Jesus repeats His first miracle just so that Peter might understand it. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, meaning John the Apostle, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. 
Now, uh, what made that click? I think it was exactly the remembering of the first miracle. Because you know who came and helped them drag that in? James and John. Remember, it said their partners went out to them and they all got it in together. In other words, the ship, it was too much for Peter and Andrew to do it. The ship was slowing down, so they got them some help. You remember that? So, who did it click with? John. See, you're going to have experiences through your life that you may not know that there was about three and a half years difference in these two events. You know what? It may be 15 years from now before you realize, okay, that's why that happened. Now, now I understand. And you know what? You should, what you should do? Be patient in the middle. Just wait on the Lord. Just, just see what He has uh, He has for you in the interim. And, and so, uh, John got it immediately and he had to tell Peter. Now when Simon Peter heard it, heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat about him, for he was naked. Don't lose nothing in the translation there either. Um, and he and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as there were, but as it were 200 cubits, which is about 600 feet, um, dragging the net with the fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire on the coals. They saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid their own and bread. And Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish that ye have now caught. And Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of uh, great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. For all that were so, for all there were were so many, yet was not the net broken. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, that. Um, Peter, I mean, excuse me, Jesus had fish on the fire. But He still asked them for theirs too. You know what? Jesus has everything He needs. He has to because He's sovereign. But He's asking for something for you this morning. He's asking for your fish too. And you know what? Nine-tenths of the time, we're not giving it. Now, I also want you to see this time the nets didn't break. When you read, when you read that in Matthew chapter 6, 5, 6, the, the nets broke. But here, you know what? The nets are strong enough. They're, the, 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 they're, they're going to hope. And the last thing I'll have you see that it was particular because it's 153. And so, it, it, it is a specific number of people that are going to come. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that this is Christ seeing Him, knowing Him, that He knows all things down to the number of fish you caught. That, that's pretty humbling, is it not? He knows the good, and unfortunately He knows the not so good. Kind of humbling, isn't it? He knows where we're at. Last place, Acts chapter 1, verse 7. Acts chapter 1 and verse 7. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put under His own power. So the next time someone tells you when Christ is com coming, you quote Acts 1, 7 to them. That's not for us to know. And you know what? If it's not us for us to know, don't sweat about it. That makes sense? You know, I have to, I have to trust God enough. If, if it's not for me to know, you know what? I don't need to know. Yeah. 
You know, one time, I, I can't even remember it, but my mom used a dirty, you know, not too, don't, but I showed too bad. And uh, I was on the phone. No, she was on the phone when I came home from school. We still lived in Carlisle. And I don't know, she talked for a long time. Of course, you know how it is to hear half of a conversation. And by the time that she got off the phone, and, and you know, being kids, what they are, a little rude, I said, Mama, don't do it. You ever done that? Mama, who is that? And so finally, she got off the phone, and I'm talking a long conversation for Mom, probably an hour. And she hung up the phone and turned around and said, You don't need to know. And you know what? To this day, that's been over 40 years ago, I still don't know who she was talking to. And you know what? I have to assume that I didn't need to know. Right? And the coming of our Lord Jesus is in the hands of the Almighty, and we should trust Him enough for that. Verse 8, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and, and in Samaria and unto the other uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received them, him out of their sight. Now the, the last thing I, I want you to see is that the Lord Jesus gravity giving off and Him ascending back to the Father. You know what? I love to see Jesus that way. And don't read into that scripture because it didn't say that the cloud picked Him up. It said that He just that He started just elevating. And then He went so far the cloud received Him out of His sight. But He literally just took off. You know what? That, that's Christ that's God. That's Christ that nothing holds down. I like to see Him that way, don't you? Yeah. That, that He's able to do any and everything. I like to see Him that way. So, this morning, how do you see Him? It's, it's very important that you see Him as He is. Uh, you know, uh, you know we're... I think he's I think he's at the hand of the Father right now, don't you? I think uh, sometimes where the Word of God he stands up because somebody extra special is coming home. If you if you read the 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 stoning of Stephen, you have to believe that, right? Uh, I wonder what he did when Paul went home. And, and sadly, if you'll let your mind do this, I wonder what it do when you get home. You see what I'm saying? I like to see Jesus that way. How do you like to see Jesus? How do you like to view Him? How, how do you like to think about Him? I think that's real important. 